Techbusters, proudly brought to you by Ericsson. Good evening and welcome to Tech Busters. This is a show that will keep you up to date with what's happening in the world of technology. Interesting conversation and things that you'll leave the show at the end of the 30 minutes. You're going, hmm, that was interesting and I learned something. That's what Tech Busters is all about. Lovely to have you with us. My gorgeous co-host who's had his new hairstyle done. He's looking fabulous and look at him, dashing, dashing, dashing. Is He's at Mr. Shapshak on Twitter. I'm at Aki Anastasiu. Mr. Shapshak, lovely to see you. Is that a 3D camera in your hand or you're just happy to see me? Just happy to see you, actually. <laughs> yeah, this is one of the things we're going to be talking about on the show tonight. This 3D camera, we'll be talking about the Samsung Note 7 that was recently announced. But uh, here's a, a glimpse of what you can expect on the show tonight. Tonight on Tech Busters. We take a look at a black hole devouring a star. Tanya Akoni from UNICEF explains how they're embracing innovation. And Aki investigates Barclays Big Data. All this and more tonight on Tech Busters. Some 3.9 billion years ago, in the heart of a distant galaxy, the tidal pool of a monster black hole shredded a star that wandered too close. Now, NASA have reconstructed what actually happens when a black hole swallows a star. And it's pretty scary stuff, but it's pretty awesome as well. Take a look at this. In 2011, NASA's SWIFT satellite caught an X-ray outburst from a small galaxy 3.8 billion light years away. Within a couple of days, researchers realized they were witnessing the aftermath of a tidal disruption event, a star ripped apart by the monster black hole at the galaxy's center. Some of the stellar material fell toward the black hole, forming an accretion disk and a jet pointed in our direction. Tidal disruption events offer us this rare view at the most common kind of supermassive black hole in the universe, these so-called dormant supermassive black holes. 90% of black holes in the universe don't have a lot of hot material orbiting around them. They don't form these accretion disks, and so we can't observe them. Tidal disruption events where the stellar debris causes the formation of a temporary accretion disk offers us a way to probe this population of supermassive black holes. Recently, astronomers introduced a new analysis technique that for the first time allows them to peer deep into the gravitational well of a normally quiescent black hole. Called X-ray reverberation mapping, the method charts the region close to the black hole using light echoes from X-ray flashes similar to the way sonar uses sound to map the ocean floor. It's not like a normal accretion flow in an active galaxy that's a flat disk. This is something that is extremely puffy, very turbulent, and we are measuring flashes of X-ray emission deep within this newly formed accretion disk. Stellar material streamed into the developing disk, churning it into a thick, chaotic whirlpool of X-ray emitting gas funneling toward the central black hole. Deep inside this cavity, multiple X-ray flares erupted, providing a flash that echoed throughout the region. We found that the mass of the black hole is something on the order of a million times the mass of the sun. The first observations of X-ray reverberations from deep inside an accretion disk are providing new insights into a rarely observed class of black holes. They're also laying the groundwork for a better understanding of tidal disruption events and the black holes they illuminate. UNICEF is an extraordinary organization run by the UN. Its focus is on children and how to give children a better quality of life, especially in those crucial thousand days, which is the first years of their life. And what they're doing is really very interesting, taking some of the smart ideas from the tech startup industry and applying it to the UN and to UNICEF as a, a whole. Joining me in studio is a, a South African, Tanya Okoni, who has done spectacularly well uh, in a global organization. You're a senior advisor on innovation and you're the de direct, deputy director 
of UNICEF's Global Innovation Centre and you take a look at innovation from a very different perspective, don't you, and how to roll out UNICEF and the UN services to more and more people. Just talk us through about this, this remarkable understanding and of, of innovation for this remarkable organisation. Thanks for that kind introduction, Toby. Um, and yes, I think we do take a, a different sort of riff on innovation. I mean, we look particularly at Africa for a lot of inspiration because we believe that you know, where there's greatest necessity, there's greatest invention, and that's been our experience. Um, you know, a lot of people don't invest in concepts, they invest in success. And so what we've done is looked around Africa, Asia, you know, Latin America for great ideas that have a potential to make great life-saving differences to, for example, the 11 children who'll die this minute um, uh, it, who are under two years old. And so We've seen technology that does really simple things elegantly, fast, simple, cheap, efficiently, moving piles of paper that could sit in offices and take two to three years to get the information to people who could make a difference and move that in seconds. Um, and so, you know, we look at what could work. The mobile phone is, has been a, a terrific um, uh, exponential enabler, enabler exactly, um, of different solutions um, for us, particularly in this um, in crucial window. And it does simple things, but for us, you know, technology is kind of almost 10% and it's the human wet wear part of the technology that is so important and it's the piece that we understand the best. Um, we work at 143 countries right now. Um, we're scaling up innovations, uh, a lot of them on mobile, many of them not, in 81 countries around the world. Um, and they all have this a piece of either significantly improving the quality of life of a child or a young person or a mom or you know that whole community that supports um, the, the sort of future generations or literally saves lives. And this is what the, the Global Innovation Centre is. I was there a year ago for the launch. I'm you were. very impressed with this, this way that a, 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 an organisation is looking at how to make itself more optimal and, and to, to, to extract these tech startup lessons to do what is a very noble thing and make children's lives better. Absolutely, and you know, I think, you know, if you think about uh, tech startups being, you know, very bootstrapped, very lean, um, we're a team of 15 people who, who support 81 countries. Um, we're looking at scaling well beyond what UNICEF can do because the rate of change, the rate of challenge is so significant. You know, we alone can't address this. We work uh, to support, you know, lots of governments and people at the grassroots level in using technologies. Um, and everything we do is an investment in sort of taking out the risk so people have tried, tested and trusted solutions that can scale, you know, nationally, millions and millions of people um, affecting millions and millions of lives. Um, and you know, what we also do is take those solutions, package them and uh, open source it all. So what we invest in is not only for you know, improving UNICEF in making sure that every dollar that is donated to our organization works harder and more efficiently, delivers more impact, saves more lives, um, but also that that positive impact can be you know, taken advantage of, of any organization working in that space, you know, working on emergencies, working in development. Um, so everything is either you know, released through open source, open design, and we encourage private sector tech startups or tech uh, companies that are quite established to help contribute their, um, their skills, their expertise in building out that infrastructure for the global public good. So for example, uh, in Uganda, there are now four times as many children getting their vaccination shots uh, than there were uh, before we put in a system that just basically asked every clinic in the country to report on a few key things once a week. Um, in other cases, Central African Republic, a country that's been in the news more for its conflict uh, than in investment in change and building um, system strength. But in that country, every single school reports once a week on what's happening, what's, uh, you know, both the quality of the teaching, the children who are in school, and unfortunately, that sort of uh, reporting mechanism also used to, to share information for a rapid response in case a school has been attacked. But, you know, literally, this is a technology that improves lives, saves lives, you know, can reduce the time it takes for information and decisions to happen that have real impact. It's just a heartening story. Thank you so much, Tanya. I mean, this, this is where technology really literally saves lives and the lives of children. Thank you very much for coming in. Thanks for having me. Good morning, my name is Lee Liller. I'm with the city of Rockville. We are here today to show you our SL RAT. Um, it's a new machine that uh, the city of Rockville purchased. It's basically a device that allows us to send 
uh, sound waves through our sewer main to give us a reading on whether or how clogged up our sewer system is. We're getting ready to take you all on a, on a ride along of our daily routine of the SL RAT and maintenance of the sewer mains throughout the city of Rockville, so let's go. Basically, we go to two manholes, we pop both lids, we stick the SL RAS down inside of both holes. Um, we hit the start button, basically letting the system run its course, um, sending the sound waves through the, to, through the manhole. Basically, it bounces off of each other, giving a reading. These readings range from zero to 10. Six through 10 being? Good numbers because it's indicating that the pipe is clear. And zero through five? I've indicated that there's something clogging the pipe. I'm starting to test. As you can hear, the sound is now starting. Okay, now the test is over. I'm gonna to proceed to pull the machine out, close this manhole up, and we're gonna proceed up the street and see what the number was. I had that in, but I hit mine and came up so as a seven. We got a seven as our reading. A seven's telling us that the pipe is pretty much clear. Before the city purchased this, we usually use the camera truck. Since these came along, it makes it a lot easier. You know, you can cover more area. And we just put in the numbers that we got. That, that way we know that this section has been done. We can probably cover 6,000 feet with these machines to where during a full day of camera and I can only go ahead and cover, you know, 1,500 feet. All right, we appreciate y'all coming out today and hopefully see y'all again. It is widely believed that the younger you are, the easier it is for you to learn a new language and new research is finding that holds true for sign language as well. Psychologist Rain Bosworth says that by five months old, babies are universal language sponges, attracted to language in their environment, and this includes sign language. Take a look at this fascinating scientific research being done. Hello. Hello. It's a typical day at the Infant Vision Lab, <laughs> which is to say a full house of both hearing and deaf children ready to take their turns in the hot seat. Better. There you go. With support from the National Science Foundation, psychologist Rain Bosworth and a team at the University of California, San Diego, are putting kids like five-year-old Julia, who is deaf, to the test. So we're trying to figure out what the impact of deafness is on perception and cognition, and what the impact of early language exposure, specifically sign language exposure, is on perception and cognition as well. All right, we're ready to start. So when the puppies come up, you can talk to her. Eight-month-old Wells is a hearing baby, part of the control group. They use an eye tracker to monitor where she focuses her attention as she watches a video. You're doing great. So the eye tracking tool is really powerful. We've been able to collect a copious amount of data in a short period of time. We get one data point roughly every eight milliseconds. While they're watching the screen, we are recording in real time where the baby is looking. Research shows that deaf adults have more sensitive peripheral vision than hearing people. Bosworth wants to know how early that enhanced visual perception starts. So here you can see that that face is changing. And this is a measure of, of, how, of sensitivity to faces at a young age. Do we want to see what's the youngest age? We can test face sensitivity in deaf and hearing babies and see if it emerges earlier in deaf babies. There's Elmo. Using eye tracking, Bosworth's team has also shown that very young hearing babies, even if they have never seen sign language before, can tell the difference between actual signed words and other hand movements. For example, if a baby were to see the sign for cat, and this is the sign for cat, as compared to a gesture that's more like this, a baby as young as five or six months old would be able to recognize the difference. They have the intuition of language for what's real language and what isn't. Good job, you lost the shoe. Isaac, who is not deaf, is six and a half months old, so still in that early sweet spot for language exposure. 
by five months, we think that babies are just like universal language sponges. They mm. have language radar. They just want to find language in their environment. And that's why they're really good at le learning languages as infants. And what about deaf babies who are getting cochlear implants at around a year old and soon will be able to hear? Would learning signs just slow them down? The answer is no. Bosworth says they should still be exposed to sign language during those key early months. Sign language exposure would provide the critical language input at the right time, at the time when they really need it the most, and that can support learning a spoken language later. So the take-home lesson? All babies have innate sensitivity to all languages. Whether you speak or sign, whether your child is hearing or deaf, Keep on with the baby talk. So big data is really big news. You often hear of people talking about, oh, big data, big data, but big data is useless if you don't do anything with it. This is what the guys at Barclays were telling me when they were in South Africa from the head office in the UK and uh, finding out their insights and how they see big data working within a fintech environment. Take a look at this. So the banks also now become a very powerful tool because are you going to take this data and perhaps sell it to other sources if they want to find out more about a specific customer or your customers in general of a specific time and dem demographic. Is the bank going to take this data and perhaps sell it and use it from a marketing perspective? Um, so I don't think banks will, will go into the selling the data business simply because they have a core business which is very healthy and, and usually very profitable. However, uh, I think what is happening is interesting from another direction. Uh, in Europe, and I'm sure around the world this will happen, in Europe something uh, coming up now is called PSD2, Payment Services Directive 2, which is the regulator telling the banks, the basic message here in common language is, the data you have about the consumer is actually owned by the consumer, and if the consumer tells you, I need you to share this data set with another bank, you are supposed to make this data shareable. But to me, that was a surprise that the regulator is actually driving the data sharing economy in this sense because they want to protect the consumer and because they want to give the consumer other options. So this poses, this will actually el escalate the data race in banks significantly across Europe. Because if now I share my data about my consumers with you, my competitor, right? I now also have the opportunity to consume your data and figure out what your consumers are about and now figure out how to attract them and how to get the better ones into my bank. I see positives and I see negatives. The, the positives I see uh, in banking for sure, um, there are very large segments out there, for example, who deserve better credit. We as banks don't give them that better credit because we don't know enough about them. What's happening today, and I've seen this and I've seen evidence of it, and in fact we have programs around it, once you start collecting data from these other sources, you actually start understanding that, hey, even though this person has a low salary, they're actually a very good credit risk because they're consistent, they never you know, miss a payment, uh, they watch what they're doing, their balance isn't erratic. All that additional information that comes from additional analysis can benefit a lot more people. So that fundamental understanding, better understanding, as long as you have the trust, and I agree with you there, I think in all the surveys, consumers were asked, do you trust Facebook, do you trust Google, do you trust you know, Microsoft, or do you trust the bank? And all of them, by a far margin, said, we trust our bank. Despite all the negative you know, stuff you hear about banks, there is still a fundamental trust because that's, their, that's where they put their money, that's where they feel you know, that security. So I think the opportunity is with the banks to capitalize on that trust and build around it and enable it. In fact, I believe the future uh, is around two areas. One is the banks will enable the consumer to share with a lot of control their data with different parties. Uh, the other area is, is essentially the new, the new perimeter for security. That is a whole new frontier that is uh, taking a sh shape that is very different than all the classical thinking. And that's, I think, where a lot of the innovation will come, is how do we protect you and protect your data and protect your identity when you want that freedom to actually work uh, on, on uh, different social networks and share information, sometimes maybe too much, 
but you want to have that freedom, yet you want to have the ability to bring it back under control. Basil, uh, this is the new gold for the banks, it sounds like. Uh, the data is a huge resource for the banks, and the banks that mine the data properly, analyze the 3D analytics properly, are the banks that are really going to be the ones who will be ultimately successful over the others. Uh, is this where it's going? You know, one thing that's really interesting, you talk about what happens three years from now, is that um, for the most part, what enterprises are finding out is that companies, they only hold a very small chunk of the data that, uh, that consumers have. In other words, really, if you're talking about, and Osama was talking about Twitter and others, if you talk about a consumer or a client or even potentially a company, there's only very little data that you hold. The rest is out there. The rest is at Uber, the rest is at Google, it's at SAP, it's United Airlines, it's you know, South African Airlines. So really, I think the next game, and, and what you'll see something that's disruptive is, how do you get this data with privacy, you know, with the right level of privacy and regulations? How do you get this data actually in an effective way around the consumer? And really looking at it in a, in a, again, in a very beneficial way to the consumer. I go to the doctor today and they have no idea since the last visit what happened to me. Here, look at the chart from two months ago. Meanwhile, I have an eye watch, so there's no reason why you should not be able to look at it and say, hey, I'm noticing you're you know, running less, you're you know, sleeping less, you're doing this. So it's that type of applications that will really improve our lifestyle. Basil, oh yeah. Thank you. And uh, Osama Fayyad, thank you for joining us uh, this evening. Well, Samsung announced the, the latest in the Galaxy Note series and uh, an interesting move, they've kind of gone with all the sevens because they jumped from the Note 5 to the Note 7, which was announced just the other day and it will be available in South Africa in the early part of September. But uh, certainly following on the success of the Galaxy uh, S7 and the S7 Edge, the Note 7 brings in all the success of the previous devices into this bigger 5.5 inch tablet device. Toby, it's, it's quite interesting where Samsung is going. You almost get a sense that Samsung have got their mojo back. Yeah, they do. Their latest results were very good. They've made a, a good, sizable profit. They've skipped a number from the Note 5 to the Note 7 just to kind of sync up with the, yes. with the other, the Galaxy S and the Edge. Um, and uh, yeah, by all accounts, a, a, a very good product, you know, mm. both sides of the screen are now you know kind of got a curved edge yes um and uh, they they seem to be picking up ahead of steam yeah listen it's an interesting uh, device they use the usb c um uh, input uh, you know a d device to 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 connect the device and to charge it it's got all the capabilities that the the s7 has got uh, the same kind of camera same kind of processor that it's got but the differentiator here is the s pen and how people still like to use a pen on a device which i find quite interesting and of course the, the big thing that they're punting is the vr as well and it's interesting to see how vr is growing uh, just bigger and bigger and I think that VR is such an interesting technology to, to, to watch because it's driven primarily by Facebook and I'm seeing more and more 360 degree photographs uh, on the uh, devices and on my social media. Now speaking of 360 degree photographs and, and video and virtual reality, this is a device I've been playing with. This is the Ricoh Theta S uh, camera. Now you'll notice it looks very similar to a smartphone. It's got a, a charging jack, an HDMI jack, and really what this is, it's a 360 degree camera. And what differentiates is are the lenses. Now you'll notice on this side, there's a fisheye lens. And on this side, there's another fisheye lens. And uh, simply how it works is you can take video, you can take a picture with this, and you can be with your friends outside and you can share the content on Facebook, you can upload the videos to YouTube, and you can consume the content with a VR headset if you want to watch the video, for example, or the photographs uh, come out onto a Facebook page or a regular website, and you can use your mouse or your, your, your finger on your phone to go up, down, across. And it works very simply. All you do is you lift the camera up like this, you press the button, it takes the photograph, and as soon as you've taken the photograph, it syncs it on the phone and it appears like this. So if you look at the phone, this is the photograph we just took. There's my thumb and you can just scroll across like that. That's Mr. Shapshak. You can zoom into him. You can see his traditional <laughs> signature greeting that he gives me every single show. And, and what's cool, that you're watching the show here, right? But do you want to see what the camera crew looks like? Well, no problem. There's a camera crew. Can you see the cameras at the back shooting everything? This is what the studio looks like in 360 degrees. It's a great little device. It's, it's amazing fantastic. how photography has evolved. Eh? 
It has indeed, and, it, and, and by all accounts, it's so easy to use. <laughs> no, seriously. But it's a great thing, you know, and the, and the great thing use. is that it uses the gyroscope in your camera. So, you know, pe you know, people like Craig Wilson have posted pictures to Facebook and you turn your phone and it gives you yeah. a 360 degree. Great to see Rico coming back, you know. Yeah, they were, absolutely. They were, they were real leaders in the, in the old uh, 35 mil uh, print um, film era with, a, with, a, with mm. a, a single lens reflex and SLR. So great to see them, you know, yeah. back in the digital fold doing something that's yeah. still for now very cutting edge. Well, I must say it's the, the, the fisheye lens is the only lens I've seen really enhance your features properly that actually makes you look better than a normal photograph. Well, as my friend Steven so famously said about me, <laughs> devilishly handsome but not very bright. Thank you very much for joining uh, the two of us as we insult each other on television. That's been another episode of Tech Busters. Good night.